Hey, thank you. So good to be with you. How you doing, church? Good. Hey, I am so glad to be with you, and my new football team is the Dallas Cowboys. It's like I'm dividing the church, apparently. All right. That's right, the Cowboys. So we look forward to a fantastic season with them boys. There's a whole long backstory to how I came to believe in the Dallas Cowboys, <laughs> but uh, I'll tell, talk about that another time. But right now, let's jump into the Word. Um, if you're new, as Molly said, I'm Jeremy, so I'm glad to meet you. If you're new since June, you haven't seen me, and uh, I, I want to thank everybody. I had a wonderful time away, and uh, it's really refreshing, and, and that's why we're going to be here for two hours. But I want to say <laughs> that I'm thankful to you all and to our staff and our volunteers. They just did a phenomenal job throughout the course of the summer. Give it up for them. Honestly, um, you know, I, I had no worries when I was gone because I know our team, and I know you, and I know that everything was going to be absolutely great. I literally did not check in one time all summer. I didn't, you know. People think, hey, were you calling? Were you, like, making sure everything? No. Like, I didn't have to check in once, which meant I could really relax, and I knew we had a great team of people. So really, really thankful for our teams. And, hey, as Molly mentioned, Wednesday Night Wisdom, I'm going to be talking to you this Wednesday night about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That's the next beatitude that Jesus talked about, and I'm going to be talking to you on Wednesday at 6 p.m. It'd be great if you could be there. We only have two more of these uh, to go over before small group season starts, and I'm looking forward to talking about how to hunger and thirst uh, for righteousness. Now, I want you to turn to the book of James. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of James. I would love it if you would bring paper Bibles, regular Bibles. I know we all use our phones for our Bibles also, but if we can get in the habit of bringing a regular Bible, and here's why. You, as you read, and this is why I've actually switched back, for the most part, to my paper Bibles in my devotional in the morning, is because if you're like me, I have a ton of notifications that I get on my phone. Every news brief, sports stuff pops up on my phone. I just noticed it's easy to get sucked into the vortex when a thing comes up, Hurricane Irma coming, boom, so I press it, and then it goes to Fox News, or I press the sports, and it goes to this Padre site, and all that kinds of stuff. So I've gone back to just mainly paper and study Bibles because I won't be distracted by that. But anyways, if you bring a paper Bible, it's great. You can write in it and all that good stuff. What we're doing in this series is making sure you understand what it means to be an actual Christian. What does the Bible say a Christian does? And what does the Bible say a Christian is? Uh, what are the commitments a Christian makes? And so... Um, we're going to be talking today specifically even about how a Christian is called to go deeper into God's Word. Like how do you just go about it in a, in a way that's going to take you deeper into His Word to really make a difference in your life. So if you're someone who's seeking out the Christian faith, maybe you were invited by someone, or you're watching online, this is a great series to be a part of. Because you get to see on the front end what Jesus actually calls us to do and be. Not what culture might say, not what you maybe heard someone says a Christian actually is, but what does Jesus say a Christian is? And we're going to be looking at that. This is a great series. Even if you've been around a long time, some of this will be a reminder, and some of it will be a challenge to you. Some of it will be like, well, I haven't been doing that. I probably should dig in and, and do that. So I'm just looking forward to it. It's going to help you have a stronger commitment to Jesus. To be distinctly Christian means you read the Bible at a different level. I don't know if you noticed, I certainly have. As Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, I didn't put that in your notes, but he says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? He said that to people. And we find that in our culture today. People saying, I'm a Christian. And, and I think if they, when they get to heaven one day and they're faced at the judgment seat, Jesus is going to say, why did you call me Lord and you didn't do what I said? It's an interesting study as we look at this. We're going to take a look at all these things that Jesus said. And we're starting with this message in the series because the Bible is the primary way God talks to us. It gives us everything we need to live a distinctly, distinctly Christian life, if we'll do what it says. So over the course of the series, we're going to be talking about these distinctly Christian attitudes and actions. Next week, I'm going to be helping you understand how to take the Bible and actually use it 
to make decisions in your daily life. So often we think the Bible is compartmentalized or for this or for that, but how do you actually integrate it into your daily life to where you're making decisions based off of what the Word of God says? So we're going to look at that next week. But the lines in our culture have been blurred. There are people doing things, accepting things, living lifestyles that are contrary to the Word of God and contrary to what Jesus taught, and they're calling themselves Christians. They're saying, I'm Christian, and I do this, and I'm a Christian, but I do that, and you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a free-for-all nowadays. Yet Jesus had some very specific things that he calls his followers to be and to do. It has almost become a hate crime to have a different opinion than someone in Hollywood or someone in certain media outlets. It's like a hate crime. You're labeled a bigot, a hater, if you don't just accept everything that comes your way from the culture today. You're labeled now as a Christian that, oh, that's a bigot. That's someone, you know, I'm not going to bother with them. Yet Jesus had standards. He taught those standards. He lived those standards. He was spit on for those standards. He was beaten for those standards and eventually killed for those standards. You need a filter in life. You got to have a filter. We have a filter for everything in life, don't we? You got an oil filter, you got an air filter, you got HVAC filters, you've got Name it. You got a filter. You got internet filters, right? We got filters for everything. You need a life filter. The Word of God helps us filter things in and out of our life. A filter keeps the dirt out. What is your filter when some dirt comes your way? Do you just accept it and hope it doesn't affect you? Running your vehicle without an oil filter, it, it'll run, but it's not going to run real well for real long. It's going to die a lot sooner. That dirt's going to build up. And it's going to seize the engine eventually, sooner than if you had the oil filter. You run your HVAC without any filters, well, you're going to be replacing those a lot sooner. you got to have a filter. God's Word is our filter for life. So I want to talk to you about being a biblical Christian and our view of reading the Bible and what it really means. Not what culture says, not what your well-meaning relative or friend said about the Bible who didn't spend much time in the Bible. We all have relatives like that. It is so interesting. Everybody has an opinion on the Bible, but if they're honest, they haven't dug into it. It's like the guy I played golf with a little while ago. <laughs> and I've told you before, I go out and I do what's called oikos golfing. I'll just tell, I'll ask the Lord to put me with somebody who I'm supposed to have a conversation with. I'll go, just go to the course, and I'll just, I'm just a single, and I go, oh, we got a threesome going out. Great. And so he did that, and it happened to be just one other guy this particular time. And we get to talking, and we're, we're going around, comes around to the Bible somehow, and he says, uh, he, he says, yeah, it's like that verse in the Bible. Yeah, you know the one that says, you know, if you're good, if you're good, then when you're reincarnated, you're going to be one of the rich people. <laughs> so I looked at him, and he didn't know I was a pastor or a Christian or anything. Uh, it was still early on in the round. <laughs> I said, the Bible doesn't say that. And he goes, how do you know? <laughs> and I said, because I read it. He goes, oh, you do? Are you one of those religious guys? I said, I guess. I'm a Christian. I said, I read the Bible, and it doesn't say that. And so over the course of time, I was able to share with him what I do and all that stuff. And it's like, bro, I mean, everyone has an opinion on, on what it says. And people, you, you've probably run across people, they misquote verses, or they say that verse is there. God helps those who help themselves. That's the famous one, right? It's not in the Bible. <laughs> Stuff like that, you know. And it's like, man, we want to know. We want to have a handle. Someone who is distinctly Christian views the Bible like this. Look at Psalm 119, 105. Read that with me, would you? Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Yeah, in America, Bibles are everywhere. I mean, every bookstore has them. You can get them uh, at the hotel they're everywhere, grocery stores. Uh, they're available in all sizes and shapes and translations, leather-bound, paperback, metal covers. I mean, they're everywhere. And every year, the Bible sells out. Every major bestseller. It, it it's outsells every one of those. Last year, listen to this, there were over 500 million Bibles published in almost 1,500 different languages. In America, the Bible's on radio, TV, talked about in books, magazines, everywhere. Yet millions of people still miss the blessing of the Bible. 
and all that the Bible promises. Why? Because receiving the good things the Bible has to offer, listen to me now, is not automatic. Just because it's all around you, just because it's everywhere, doesn't mean you automatically receive the blessings of it. The Bible is a book of blessing. It promises things like comfort in hard times, strength when you're weak, hope when you're hopeless, wisdom when you need answers, joy when you're down, power when you feel helpless, and purpose when you don't know why you're here. It promises all those things. So I want to take you to a section of Scripture in the book of James. And he walks us through, step by step, what it means to really dig in, how to dig into the Bible, and be a distinctly Christian person. Starting in verse 19, chapter 1 of the book of James. It says, my, this is in the NIV 11 version, which is the same as the Bibles that are there in your chairs. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because our anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Listen to this. Do what it says. If you have it there in your Bible, go ahead and circle that. Do what it says. Those who listen to the word but do not do what it says are like people who look at their faces in the mirror and, after looking at themselves, <laughs> go away and immediately forget what they look like. But those who look intently, that's another couple of um, words I want you to circle, look intently, we're going to break that down, into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue to do it and continue in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, that first verse, or the next verse there in your notes, there's a typo there. James, it should say 125. Somehow I put 19. There is not 19 chapters. There's five in James. So it's like, dude, you're talking about the Word of God. You can't even get that right. All right, so that's James 125 there. The, it says, the man who looks intently, or the person who looks intently into the perfect law, that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he'll be blessed in what he does. That's huge to understand. The Bible is called the perfect law because it's exactly what we need. It's also called the perfect law because it is what is known as theologically inerrant and infallible. As a, someone who is distinctly Christian, you hold the belief that the Bible is not full of errors. The Bible is not fallible, not full of faults. But today in our culture, even Christians, people that claim to be Christians are saying, yeah, you know, I don't think it really meant that. I, I don't think it really says that, actually. Mm, yeah, it does. It absolutely does. To be someone who's distinctly Christian says, I believe the God, that, that the Word of God is inerrant and it's infallible. Otherwise, what's the purpose? <laughs> what's the use? Full of errors, full of fallacies. James gives us some keys on how a Christian should read the Bible so that it actually makes a difference in your life. And just to give you background on James, if you're not familiar with James, remember he was a half-brother of Jesus. Of course, same mom, different dad, of course. All right, He, was, uh, he didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't think Jesus was the Savior. And if you've ever had a brother, they probably <laughs> thought they were the Savior, right? And so there's no way you're going to believe him. Um, and he probably heard a lot growing up, you know, oh, Jesus, that was perfect. James, your turn, you know, and he probably got bitter, <laughs> probably got pretty bitter over time. It was written in about 49 A.D. It's one of the earlier books in the New Testament. Um, James became a believer after the resurrection. It's almost like Jesus came back and was like, James, I told you. <laughs> I told you, you know, and James was like, oh, Oh, you're right. And he became the leader of the Jerusalem church, which was the most influential at the time. I mean, phenomenal church. And James was a leader of that church. And he wrote this letter because, look, even in the first century, they're dealing with the same things we're dealing with today, with people who were claiming to be Christians but living a different life. And so he writes this, and God knew it would be useful for us Today, So here's the first key. If you're going to be a distinctly Christian person in our culture, I must accept God's word, write that down if you would, as God's actual word. 
That, that, you're, that when someone starts hammering against the Bible and they start saying things like, oh, it's just a bunch of stories, and you know it's actually full of errors, and they sound like they know what they're talking about, that you'll stand up and say, no, it's not. No, that is God's word. It is what God meant to say, and God knew that we'd be reading it today. It is why it has survived centuries, even though people have tried to destroy it every year since its inception. People have tried to destroy it, and God said, my word will not return void. You can never destroy it. So I accept it as what it is, the holy book, not full of errors, but exactly what God wanted to say. Look at the next verse, James 1.21. It says to accept the word planted in you. Accept it. Circle the word accept there, would you? Because I'm going to get Greek on you a little bit. I've been gone a while, so i got some Greek for you, okay? I love the Greek because the Greek language, which the New Testament was originally <laughs> written in Greek, it gives a depth of understanding that you don't get with the English. The English just says accept the word. You go, okay, I'm supposed to accept it. No, no, no. But the Greek is paradekomai. That word, that word accept is paradekomai. It's the middle voice of a primary verb. I just wanted to nerd out on you for a second. All right, here's the application. Here's the application. It's a hospitality term, which actually means to welcome in with excitement. You know when someone, you're anticipating someone coming to your house and you can't wait for them to get there, family member, whatever, and then you open the door and they're like, I'm so glad to see you, right? And you just hug and it's like, come on in. That's the idea that it's talking about. It's a hospitality term that says you welcome in the word of God. You don't just say, I am supposed to accept it. No, you welcome it in your, oh, God, what do you have for me today? Oh, I can't wait to read. I can't wait to what you're going to tell me. We've got to welcome it in. Accept it means, man, it's a hospitality. Hold it. Like, yes. James gives us an illustration. He says, it's planted in you. And he gives you the example of a, a soil and a seed. You remember, Jesus gave us this example in Luke 8 uh, of the parable of the farmer sowing seed and it's the same idea all throughout scripture compares itself the scripture compares itself to seed jesus told the parable of the sower the word of god is the seed that's planted in our hearts how is it you could take two seeds okay let's say it's a tree seed you plant one over here and it thrives it grows it becomes humongous it's incredible you plant one over here and it shrivels and dies and never grows What's the difference? The soil, right? It's all about the soil. Same seed. Problem isn't the seed. Problem is the soil. James is telling us, confirming what his brother Jesus said, and saying, listen, the problem isn't the seed, man. The problem is always the soil. It says it's all about the soil. One soil is prepared and ready. One soil is dry and not. It's that simple. How can two people sit in the same church service and afterwards one per person say, oh, that's what I needed. I'm going to do that. I'm so glad I heard that. And another person say, man, I didn't get anything out of that. One soil's ready, fertile, water. Other soil's dry, dry as a bone, not going to receive any kind of seed. The problem's not with the seed. The problem is with the soil. One heart's prepared, one isn't. And James says we've got to receive the word with the right attitude. And then he gives us some attitudes that we need to have ready to receive the word. This is huge to understand. This is how you prepare your heart before church. This is how you prepare your heart before you go into your devotionals. This is how you get ready so that that soil is ready. Number one, I want you to write this down there in your notes. Expect to hear from God. There should be an expectation. Paradecomai. Ready. God, I'm, I want to welcome you in. What do you got to say to me today? I'm expecting to hear from you because I know you got a word for me. I'm excited. That's huge to understand. You expect to hear from God. Look at verse 19. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. What does that mean? Give it your full attention. Your full attention. Be alert. Don't miss it. Shut the phone down. That kind of idea to where you can't get any notifications while you're doing your devotionals, while you're in church focused. Don't tweet. Don't talk. Because, listen, God will not try to shout louder over your biggest distraction. He never does, and he never will. He doesn't compete with that. And when I'm talking, I'm not listening. When you're talking, you're not listening. But here's another heart attitude. You've got to be calm. You've got to calm down. In order to receive God's word, 
and be blessed by it. Verse 19b, it says, and slow to become angry. A relaxed attitude increases your receptivity to the word. That's why if you have an argument with your spouse on your way to church or in the parking lot, you come in here, you're kind of fired up, you're not really receiving what's being said. I, I might even look out there, it looks like you're taking notes. All you're doing is writing down the issues that you're going to bring up with your spouse later. You're like, uh-huh, uh, yeah, that's right. And then you, you might be amening it, but you're just amening because that's what he needs. Amen. Speak it, Pastor. Amen. Right? Put him in some soil. Right? That's what you're thinking. So you, if you're arguing before you come, you can't calm down and hear the word. You get too, if, if you're too uptight and stuff. Listen, the reason we built the cafe was not just because coffee is awesome. Right? The reason we built the cafe was so um, you will be more calmed down. Because when people have coffee in their hand or one of our other uh, drinks over there, they tend to calm down more with just something in their hand. Snack, coffee. We built it so that you would be relaxed enough to be able to receive the Word of God and to be able to draw you closer to Jesus. The reason why we have secure check-in, why we have security around here, you, you won't even see them. That's intentional. Okay, but we have security around here. Uh, so that you know your kids are safe, and we have a check-in system, so they have the tags and everything else, and we have, we have security monitoring the kids' area. Why? So you can come in here and focus on the Word. So you don't have to be thinking about, are my kids safe? That guy's a creeper. Is he out there? What's he, what's, you, you're not going to be able to pay attention, right? So we work hard on all those things so that you know, you, so that you can be relaxed and be able to calm down and just for an hour be able to worship and get the word in. Because we don't hear much when we're worried or upset or bitter or resentful. We do if we don't have coffee, right? But, but we don't get that way. We don't get the word in us. Studies show when you listen, it actually lowers your blood pressure. But when you speak, it raises it. Be calm. But here's the next one. Be clean. Be clean. Check this out. In verse 21, it says, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Before you can plant a seed, let's say you want to plant grass. Now, I, I, uh, we bought a foreclosure about a year and a half ago, and it was a mess. And the backyard's all dirt, all dirt. And then, you know, weeds, of course. Weeds just grow up, and you got to keep knocking the weeds out. Well, I had a guy come over and give me an estimate um, back in the spring for sod. You know, hey, what is it going to take sod this backyard? I want grass, man. I'm tired of looking out dirt. And he says, uh, well, first thing we're going to have to do is kill all the weeds. You know, we've got to get rid of those weeds, and we've got to kill them so much so by the roots so that they don't start coming up through the grass. So, yeah, of course, right? So had him do that, and then he put the grass in. It's beautiful now. Lush. Beautiful. Okay, the same idea here. What he's saying is before the seed, the word of God can be planted in your heart, you got to get rid of the weeds in your life. You got to get rid of the junk and the moral filth. How do you do that? You confess it. He says, confess it. The word filth here is the Greek word uperion. Uperion, look at that. The word literally means, I love this. The word literally means earwax. <laughs> Think about this. Okay, this is why, like I said, you get into this stuff. He's saying, look, you have to clean the earwax out in order to hear from God. If you have spiritual earwax built up, he said, if you have a moral filth and stuff going on in your life, and you're wondering why you're not being blessed, and you're wondering why things aren't happening the way you want them to happen, and you're going, what's going on? I, don't feel, like, I feel like God's a million miles away. Take the spiritual Q-tip of confession <laughs> and just get that bad boy out of there. Get it out. And then, and then you'll be able to hear. I love that, parry on. Whew. But it prevents God's word from getting in there. He says, get rid of it, confess it, and then you'll be blessed. You'll be able to go deeper. You accept it, and you move forward. Number two, write this down, reflect. You've got to reflect on God's word. You've got to take time to reflect on it. It's important to accept it. Okay, I accept God's word as God's word. Now I need to reflect on it. Take it a bit 
farther. Verse 23, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I love this illustration. He uses this illustration to say God's word is like a mirror. The purpose of a mirror is to evaluate us, right? When we look in a mirror, James isn't saying to look at yourself and your features and you just forget what you look like. We all know what we look like, but he's talking about in particular. He's talking about when you look in the mirror and your hair's askew, you know, you got bedhead going, and then maybe you got something in your teeth, you got something you got to wash your face or shave or whatever it might be. He says, he says, that's like someone who needs to do something with themselves, but they walk away completely forgetting that they got the bed head going, that they, they didn't do anything about it. He goes, what's the purpose of looking in a mirror <laughs> if it's not to fix something that you have going on? You got to clean it up. Most of you looked in a mirror this morning before you came to church. Those that didn't, we know who you are. <laughs> okay? We love you in your bed head anyway. Okay, but then you do something about it. God says a mirror reflects what we're like on the outside. God's word reflects what we're like on the inside. When we read and reflect on what the Bible says, it has a way of penetrating our hearts to show us what is wrong in our life, to show us how to get it right. Aren't you glad? It doesn't just say, oh, you're wrong, but it always shows us how to get it right. Listen to what it says in Hebrews. 412. I put it there in your notes. For the word of God is alive and active. Would you underline that? It's alive and active. That's why when people say it's just a book of stories, it's dead, it's this, it's old, it's not relevant today. No, 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 no. As a distinctly Christian person, you say, oh, yes, it is. It's alive and active. It's not dead. It's alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. He goes on. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, that's deep. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Look, hey, let's be honest. A lot of people don't read the Bible because they don't want to know what it says. They don't want to know that it cuts right into our hearts, that it tells us some things that we don't like to hear. We don't like to hear some of those things. It absolutely gets to the heart of the matter. It's painful when we see things we need to work on. We don't want to read a book that nails us with incredible accuracy. <laughs> people say, no thanks. That's fine for people who aren't Christian. That's fine for them to say, I don't want to read your book. But it's not okay as a Christian to say, I'm not going to read the Bible. That's not what a Christian does. A Christian reads the Bible because we want to honor God with our life. Take a look at verse 25. It says, whoever looks, what's the word there? Yeah, yeah, intently. Circle that, would you? Intently into the perfect law. He's talking about research more than he is just reading. He's talking about investigating. One more Greek word for you, because I'm excited about it. It's parakupto. Okay, when it, when it talks about look, it's the Greek word parakupto. Now, here's why that's important. It's actually translated... The one who stoops down and gazes into the word of God. What does that mean? That's intensity. The one who intensely digs into the word of God. That person will be blessed. To focus your attention on the word of God. So the verse can actually read, whoever stoops down and looks intently and researches and digs into the word and continues digging, researching, looking into it, not forgetting what they have heard. That's the one that will be blessed. See, it's not just reading that changes your life. It's digging, researching. The Bible says, as if you were searching for gold. That's the idea. There are two ways you look in a mirror. You gaze at it or you glance at it. It's natural for us to walk by a mirror and kind of see our our, our, you know, silhouette and go, oh, you know, you just kind of glance at it. That's natural. We do that all the time, right? But a lot of people try to do that with the Bible. They just glance at it. Maybe give God five minutes in their devotional time. Well, you're not going to get anything out of it when you're just glancing. You're not going to know what needs to be fixed here, what needs to be worked on. 
So let me encourage you to do three things when you're studying the Word of God, looking intently into the Word of God. Someone who is distinctly Christian wants to go deeper. For some of you, this is going to be just simply, you're already doing it, but for some of you, it's a, it's a reminder to do it, and others, this is what it takes. Okay, first thing, write down there if you would, set a time. Please, set a time. That might mean you have to get up 30 minutes earlier than you normally do, which means you probably have to go to bed 30 minutes earlier. <laughs> Okay, Netflix can wait. And Netflix is great, but it's great for when you control it. All right, and so set a time where you're not going to be bothered. Okay, set a place, that's the next one, where you can focus, where there's no distractions. So why I like to do it early in the morning because the kids aren't up yet, so there's no distractions. It is so easy to get distracted. And so you set a time, you set a place, and then you have a plan. Have a plan. Don't just do the skip and dip method. Okay, today I'm going to read, boom. All right? Have a plan. What are you reading? Are you going to read the book of John for a month? Are you going to read another book? Maybe you decide I'm going to read the book of James this month. Maybe it's going to be the New Testament. I'm going to read the New Testament in one year. I'm going to read the whole Bible in one year. Whatever it is, just have a plan. We have them on our app. Have a plan. Otherwise, it's too easy to kind of go, eh, maybe later. But when you schedule it, you schedule it like you're scheduling a doctor's appointment. We move heaven and earth for doctor's appointments. Oh, I got an appointment. Well, I can't go to work. Ah, I'm going to be gone half the day. I'm sorry, I can't come into work, right? I mean, we move heaven and earth for a doctor's appointment because it's scheduled. It's on the schedule. Do the same with your spiritual life. Have a time. Have a place. Have a plan. Don't let anything disturb it. And then nextly, would you write this down? Review it. Review it. Verse 25, it says, and continues to do this. That means over and over and over. The Bible calls it meditation. We think of meditation as kind of a weird, what is that, kind of Middle East or, or you know, Eastern medicine weirdo stuff? No. Meditation, it simply means thinking about something over and over again. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. <laughs> right? You've taken a negative thought and you're thinking of it over and over and over again. You're meditating, okay? The Bible tells us, take God's word and meditate on it. Think about it over and over and over again. The reason I give you outlines, okay, the reason I give you outlines is so you'll take it and review it. Review it, because I know you're not gonna remember much from the service. That's just the way it is. We don't retain everything. So we have these Notes, so you can take them home, and in your devotional time or whatever, you can review it. What is it? What did he say? Oh, yeah. Oh, that verse. I wanted to look into that a little bit more. And then our, our uh, small groups, which are coming up in a couple of weeks. Our small groups are sermon-based, so that you get in a group, and you take it farther. You review it. You go deeper with what we talked about on Sunday, because if you don't, you're not going to retain what was said. And what's going to happen during your group? You go, oh, yeah, I remember when he said that now. And it'll bring stuff up. It'll help you to grow in your walk. It'll help you to grow in your faith. It's huge to understand. And then, number three, you got to remember it. Verse 25 says, not forgetting what they have heard. Nothing will do more for your spiritual life than developing the habit of Scripture memorization. Remember some Scripture. I didn't put this in your notes, but in Psalm 119.11, It says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. It's a huge thing. As you hide God's word in your heart, you walk with God more closely. As you memorize certain scriptures, some of you say, I have a really hard time memorizing. Well, I understand that. Just try to memorize one. One. And then maybe, once you get that one, two. I don't know how long it'll take you. It might take you a long time. But it's better to have one than none. And just keep going. Keep building on that. And then lastly, I'll close up with this. Number three. All these other things are important. But this is the kingpin. This is is vital. I must respond to the word of God. You got to respond to it. Great to hear it. Great to take it in. Great to even agree with it. But if you don't respond to it and do anything about it, it's useless. Completely useless. 
Look what James tells us in verse 22. Do not merely listen to what the Word says and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Remember, this is all part of that same section of Scripture where he's talking about the reflection in the mirror. Hey, your hair is completely a mess. You need to comb it. You walk away. You don't do anything about it. He says the same thing with the Word of God. You hear a message. You read something in the Word. You walk away. You don't do anything about it. He says that's like looking in the mirror and you forgot. You got something to fix. You got something you got to do. He says it's self deception if we don't let it change us. Hey, listen, the, the test of maturity is not knowledge. The test of biblical maturity is not how much Bible do I know. It's how much Bible do I live. That's the difference. I know a lot of people who have a ton of Bible knowledge, but they are spiritual pygmies. I mean, they, they don't live it one bit, but they can cite scripture. They can throw stuff out, historical stuff about uh, uh, Bible history, they can do all that. But I have no respect for them because they're not living it. They're not living what the Bible says. Knowledge doesn't do anything if you don't live it out. That's the biggest thing. You've got to be a doer of the word. If, someone, if I told someone I, I want to build a new house, and they gave me a book, hey man, here's a step-by-step instructions on building your house. Here's how to get the permits. Here are the contractors you need. Here is everything, everything you need. And I was like, awesome. And I read it, and I went through the book, and I'm like, man, that is a lot of good information. That's awesome. And then I put the book aside, and then I start building it on my own. And I just start going for it. I lay a foundation. I start doing some framing. And then I go, oops, (laughs) I forgot the plumbing. I got to go back and do the plumbing. And then what's going to happen? I'm going to start making mistakes one after another. And then the person who gave me the book comes back and says, hey man, what is the deal with your house? It's all crooked. That's not even safe. We can't even get a per- pass the, the code on that, man. What happened? I gave you the book, the manual. I told you how to do it. Oh yeah, man, that was cool. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. I even agree with everything that was in that book. I just didn't do what you said. <laughs> I just didn't do it. That's useless, isn't it? Completely useless. And that's, that's a, what a lot of people who say they're Christian do. I agree with the Bible. I think there's a lot of good stuff in it, but they're not living it. And that makes all the difference. They're wondering why. I feel like God's attacking me. I feel like my life is is crumbling. I feel like things are so difficult. I don't understand what's going on. It's like, are you living the word or are you just kind of saying that you're living it? My honest prayer on Sunday afternoons is that you will remember what is said on Sundays and put it into practice. Whoever speaks up here goes through a lot during the week to get a message ready to give it to you. And our prayer is always, oh man, if they will put it into practice, it's worth it. And I pray our church continues to have the reputation and gets greater influence in people understanding and knowing that that's a church where they're doers of the word. That's a church where they are a living Bible. The best translation of any Bible is when you translate it into your life. And when you do that, you'll go deeper and deeper in this Christian faith walk, and you'll have the joy that can't be replaced with anything. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for your word and how you teach us to become distinctly Christian, and we want to go deeper and deeper and deeper in your word to learn more and how to apply it to our lives. We thank you that it's not a big mystery. We thank you that even though it's attacked constantly, that we can hold it up as the truth, the inerrant, infallible word of God. We thank you so much for it. If you're here today or you're watching online, I want to encourage you, if you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to encourage you to accept him into your life today. That means welcome him in. And you can do that in the silence of your heart. He can hear you. Just say it in your heart. God, I welcome you in. Jesus, save me. If you said that, he heard it. I want to encourage you, mark it on your connection card. There's a box on your connection card that says, I accepted Jesus today. And then just drop that in the offering boxes when you leave. We sure appreciate your faithful giving as well, your tithes and your offering. You can just drop those in the offering boxes. When you leave, along with your connection cards, we sure appreciate it. God, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing and calling us to greater faith and greater strength and wisdom. 
It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord. Thank <laughs> you.